morning good afternoon good evening wherever you might be joining us and welcome to this session in financial inclusion week uh, organized by the center for financial inclusion our session is titled bank accounts in place but digital access awaits barriers to access for women from the global south new financial technologies have been held up as a critical means of de delivering poverty reduction across much of the global south as a World Bank official interviewed by the Financial Times in early 2019 summed it up, it reduces costs, it's much more efficient, it can be scaled up. It does come with risks as well because, you know, you really don't want to hurt those that are most vulnerable. So we have to be careful. But I think it's really remarkable. Going over to the banking side of things, in 2022, 1 1.4 billion people are unbanked compared to 2017 where there were still 1.7 billion adults in the world without an account at a financial institution or a mobile money provider. This is remarkable since 2014, where 2 billion people were classified as unbanked. This Swindex report that I'm quoting from identifies China, India, Indonesia, and Pakistan as the countries with the biggest shares of financially excluded individuals. But it remains a pervasive problem across other parts of Asia, the Middle East, and Africa. Based on one of our panelists, Oran's research, about 7% of Pakistani women are financially uh, included, meaning they have at least a basic bank account. In Egypt, for example, the share of people aged 15 and over with an account to a financial institution rose from 13.7% in 2014 uh, to 33% in 2017. Uh, this is compared to 90% uh, in most advanced economies. Uh, in India, the National Family Health Survey of 2019 to 21, 91% of rural households now have a mobile phone, an increase of 4.2% when compared to the findings of 2015 and 16 by the same survey. On the other hand, 41% of uh, rural households are now said to have access to the internet with an increase of 35.3% when compared to the findings of the earlier survey. These numbers are obviously complicated and vitiated uh, because women are still 15% less likely to own a mobile phone than men and 33% less likely to access mobile internet. So FinTech involves a greatly enhanced ability to transact financial services via mobile phone, uh, digital devices or a smart device, making it easier, cheaper, and quicker, for instance, to obtain a loan, make a savings deposit, and transfer, receive money and pay for goods and services. Uh, beginning in with Kenya, M-Pesa in the late 2000s, along with major advances in digital technologies in China, the impression was created that technology markets and finance were combining to significantly improves everyone's life around the globe. We will be speaking on these matters for today. Uh, I'm Satyavrat, I'm from Good Business Lab, and Good Business Lab exists to transform labor markets in order to positively change the lives of low-income workers. Years of a rigorous evidence-based event and real-world insight have informed our belief that worker well-being is in fact good business and good business can only happen when worker well-being is prioritized. Considering our body of work is rooted in labor-intensive uh, industries, our research attempts to prioritize vulnerable populations such as migrant workers, women workers, and workers in need of upskilling. Whether it is meeting the specific needs of migrant workers, improving business efficiency and productivity, upskilling and training workers, or financially empowering women workers, Good Business Lab remains committed to its vision of incentivizing and empowering business to prioritize worker well-being through all its projects. Our panel here today is a very interesting and eclectic mix brought together from the policy table, from research, and uh, from enterprise uh, social enterprise at the very, very grassroots level. We will present empirical evidence on the impact of digital remittance training on the financial behavior of working women, the need to uh, design inclusive tech solutions and the factors that must guide the process and the various challenges uh, on the way. I will now introduce my panelists. Uh, Halima Iqbal is the CEO and founder of Oran. A former investment banker and consultant with eight years of experience, Halima moved back to Pakistan in 2017 after a decade in North America with a drive to make finance inclusive and simple for the underserved, uh, underserved millions. 
Kazim Rizvi is the founder of the Dialog, a public policy think tank based out of New Delhi. Uh, he comes from a legal background. If I'm not mistaken, Kazim, uh, you have third generation or fourth generation legal background. An important voice in uh, India's uh, uh, tech policy ecosystem, Kazim works as the on the intersection of technology, policy, and society, with a focus on evidence-based research and discourse. Smith Gade is also like me from GBL. He serves as a uh, associate director at Good Business Labs, where he oversees field-based and data-based research projects. He holds an MPhil in economics from the University of Oxford, with a focus on uh, applied ec econometrics and development economics. Now, uh, coming to the first half of our conversation, I want to start this discussion by, you know, setting some context to the problem at hand right now. And I would like to start with uh, Halima. Uh, Halima, what social biases exist which prevent women from accessing the formal financial system on a regular basis based on your work? Um, thank you so much for having me here. Very excited to be part of this panel and a very important conversation. Um, to start off with, um, in, in terms of accessing financial services for women um, from a social biases perspective, it is perceived that women, uh, the requirements, the financial requirements of women are very different than men. And the reality is it's not true. Um, they, are, they, they are required to have debit, credit, and payments. Um, and, and have that basic access. However, the distribution of those financial services is very different for women. Um, and, and I think the other, because women are not necessarily, especially in, in countries like Pakistan and India, uh, women might not be chief wage earners. Um, they are, their requirement or, or design around financial services is very different. In Pakistan, there's also a religious constraint. There is a high religious sensitivity when it comes to financial transactions, um, along with mobility and logistical issues that exist which hampers women from being formally financially <clears throat> included, uh, which means that technology has a far greater role to play to allow these women um, to, to be financially included and get access to capital that they require to have an upward economic mobility within their households. Thank you so much, Halima. Uh, that's... a uh... I think it's a very interesting perspective, particularly, you know, uh, I think it brings out some of these uh, specificities to uh, that uh, make this conversation so much richer. Uh, I would like to move on to uh, Kazim at this point. And Kazim, what would you say has gone wrong from a policy <laughs> standpoint as to what is uh, prevent uh, that in ensuring that women use the formal financial system, at least going by your work and uh, your extensive work on uh, many counts, including Aadhaar and uh, many others. Yeah. Thanks a lot, Satya, and thanks to Good Business Lab for organizing this session. Uh, and one more uh, point, I think when Satya was introducing me, Satya and I are also, uh, we go back from college, we studied together in the same college. So good to see you here, Satya. So uh, I think, your question and uh, I think uh, what we try to sort of understand that, uh, for this session is also in terms of policies, what could have gone better and what went wrong. I think when we look at policy from a hindsight, uh, there are a few areas where things could have been better and there is a lot of scope to improve. I think first of all is just a proper implementation of schemes and programs. Right. Uh, there was a study which was conducted recently, which held that 17% of women entrepreneurs, only 17% were actually aware of varied government schemes and financial institutions and all the programs which the government is carrying out. So I think uh, when it comes to awareness and implementation, there is a gap. Uh, how do we bridge the gap is, is something which uh, the implementation uh, uh, officials within various departments have to figure out. So I think that's one key challenge which we see. Uh, taking place. I think the second is around streamlining and easing application process, especially when it comes to credit access. Uh, I think that's something which uh, needs to be improved. Uh, it takes nothing less than one and a half to two months uh, for women and even women entrepreneurs uh, to sort of uh, 
access get access to credit so how can we streamline the process of making sure that credit is provided wherever required uh, and in india we are seeing a surge of growth of internet access we have 800 million mobile uh, internet users second highest in the world uh, and we are also seeing a rise in in the uh, access to internet to women of course there are cultural uh, issues uh, and most of the times in the family when you introduce for the mobile phone it usually goes to a man the, a male than a female but uh, we are seeing that this, just the sheer numbers in india is so huge and vast uh, there is a uh, increase of women participation in the digital ecosystem but when we look at the proportions there is still a long way to go i think another issue which we see and which could be improved uh, from a policy and implementation standpoint is uh, the need for greater gender sensitization amongst the bank staff and this is extremely important uh, for tier 3 cities for rural places for uh, villages where you know uh, you have one branch uh, in a wide in a in a area which which is uh, you know 30 to 40 uh, uh, i mean uh, within span of 30 to 40 kilometers uh, and you have to travel a lot and you don't have enough bank branches anything in those places where there is remote uh, access or there is very limited access over there as well there is a lack of sensitization amongst the banks so i think those some of these issues uh, have to be uh, sorted out and i think just specifically looking at financial inclusion uh, also the fact that uh, you know a lot of capacity building initiatives have to be carried out and from a policy point of view how can we improve capacities of different stakeholders to improve the entire process of a billing credit of giving access to internet and i think some of the some of these issues on the implementation side are critical to be addressed i think there are some uh, interesting because even oran's work is uh, actually kind of trying to help build a credit history for some of these women who join the oran committees and kazim now with the maybe if we have time at the end something i'd like to you know pick your brains about is you know the uh, pervasiveness of uh, like let's say micro credit apps and you know uh, there have been certain associate dangers with that at least in uh, nations i mean like in africa and places like that so i'd like to maybe pick up on that later if we have the time now moving towards smith smith you've worked with uh, salaried women with basic digital access however you find and these are salaried women within you know uh, sort of formal workforce in some sense right and you find within that group the uptake of uh, digital payments uh, platforms has been pretty low what do you think uh, is the reason for this? So what is your research pointing to? Yeah, so I think, yeah, so thanks, Satya. And yeah, so I think Kazim and Harima have kind of brought out a lot of issues. And I think Harima is pretty right to say that the what they need is same, but like how do we kind of provide them might need to be considered much more uh, proactively while designing things, right? So just to give a big brief background of what we're talking. So I'm trying to kind of focus much more on a specific study we have done and try to kind of have a generalized things, what we learn from it later. So just to give you some context, uh, this study that we did with ID Insight uh, was to kind of understand um, how do you kind of take uh, digital literacy or digital transaction a way forward, right? So, um, so we work with a population of workers who are already salaried women, right? So these women, once and given that there have been a lot of policy efforts to kind of get everybody bank accounts. Uh, in India, I think at the moment, having a bank account is not the major constraint because kind of the policy focus has been on that a lot. So these workers, when they join the workforce, so these are migrant workers. So India has very typical migrant corridors where many of these women that we uh, were working with uh, are the women who are coming to kind of come to Bangalore to work in garment factories, but they're basically coming from, say, Odisha or Jharkhand. And these are kind of typically young women who are coming who are like they're from 18 to 22, 23 years of age. Now, um, and just to give you a brief idea, these women kind of get a typical salary of kind of 10,000 India rupees. Um, so these are, even though they are formal sector workers, their salaries are pretty low. Uh, so kind of 
earn skill, many of them are working on like minimum state uh, wages, right? Uh, so, and then the major thing that these have is one of the major transactions these women have is remitting back home. So around these women, around remit around 55 to 60% of their earned salary back home every month. So they, they, they have a huge financial need. So these are women who have account to uh, bank accounts. These are women who working women who have account to uh, have access to bank account and they have a very typical financial need that they need to transfer large chunk of their salary home every month. And this is a recurring transaction they do, right? So when we thought about this, uh, we thought this is a perfect place to kind of see how we can improve digital access, right? So from our anecdotal uh, study suggested, very few of them use digital transaction. So then when we did our baseline with these women, around 86 or 90 to 90% of said they every month they send money home. But then only 5% of them actually use digital tools, right? So, and then, uh, so when we restricted our study, so this baseline uh, was, had women who had feature four and smartphones. So we restricted our study to smartphone users. I'll come to that later why we did that. But essentially on these women, uh, 37 to 40 percent didn't even know that they could kind of send or receive money by their smartphone, right? So that's a major information gap at basic level. But um, even if those knew, 90 percent of them didn't know how to kind of actually how it's done. So they just had some idea about rest of 90 percent of the rest had just some idea about hey, I know this can happen, but had no idea how it can actually be done. Right? So we thought an information was a very key constraint at the onset. And that's why we started to kind of um, go from there, right? So that's where we set. Uh, then I'll kind of briefly talk about what we found, right? I'll come to the solution findings in kind of later sections. But so when we kind of designed and randomized control trial around it, we thought we would do kind of an intervention where we kind of do a very typical policy setting where usually how Indian government or anyone is trying to act, give uh, financial access is a classroom teaching base. So we went to our first kind of pilot for our experiment when we kind of prepared or like, so we are, we are going to the UPI system to do transaction where a system where if you successfully do it, it will give you 50 rupees as one to practice. And then we had designed some behavioral nudges to go around. And our thing was that, how do you test it? And just to give you a thing, and first pilot that we did after all this preparation for six months, out of 20 people that we got on, we were successfully able to get zero women on the platform. <laughs> so kind of this led to a lot of rethink and like our kind of, we thought it was something that we can have an easy win as an experiment. And then we realized that first pilot, um, we had like literally around almost zero women who could actually get. So that needed us to kind of go back and rethink a lot of things we thought was the critical constraint. Uh, but just to give you a brief outline, that meant that um, many of women didn't have their phone linked to their bank account. It was very hard to get that done. Then it meant that they needed to have phone balance in account to send and receive SMS, right? Many women didn't have. It needed same SIM, like even if they had multi, like same SIM, like they had multiple SIMs. SIMs need to be right tray, right SIM needs to be used, right? Uh, then internet connection was an issue. They Many of them just didn't have enough space for the application in their phones, right? And then kind of all the other things followed. So when we thought, which was like an information problem while going on to get things, which was true, information was a problem. But when you're providing information through a typical classroom session, we still had so many barriers to cross to get them through. And that just highlights uh, the problem that it's not very simple to get it done. So it's because, and this is very specific problem because there are a lot of people who um, pick this thing up because they have built in things that we already have, right? Like you've been fo using phones for other things, you're using finance, other things. So when you give people who are very apt at using phone and financial services, digital services make a lot of sense to them and they can pick it natively, so to speak, right? But when somebody who are new to financial system as well as digital ecosystem, then sometimes the gap, instead of helping each other, starts the barriers start building on top of each other, right? So especially for marginalized section or women, it becomes very important to think through where they stand 
what are the barriers and how do we kind of go on addressing them because um, Indian success is a huge success in terms of digital ecosystem, but a lot of it is due to numbers, right? Just the population is so huge. And given that, so a subsection of population like picks it very easily. And given that that number is so large, you tend to forget that there are a lot of people who need way more support to kind of get on the same platform. And I just want to probe you, and maybe if you could just briefly like uh, add to this. Uh, could you expand perhaps on some of the positive social impact of women's financial inclusion, even from the study that you have mentioned over here? What has it uh, resulted in? Yeah, so uh, just to kind of give you a brief outline of this. So, for example, thinking theoretically, right? So digital uh, finance is a great tool which has helped, like there's ample evidence coming from Africa, Asia, that you know, for poor, it's great, right? But one of the things that we haven't seen a lot done, now it's the work is now getting done, is what is the gendered impact of that, right? And that means that um, there is a theoretically, uh, it's not very clear that women will definitely benefit from it, right? So because, so like most other economic uh, indicators, women lag behind men on most of those, right? Gender, pay, um, access, everything, right? So if you have this new service that comes in, which is differentially taken up by gender, uh, you might actually see this gap remaining constant or increasing, right? So it's not necessarily given that digital financial services or new financial services will necessarily reduce this gap that exists, right? So there are cases where it could kind of exacerbate this gap. For example, sometimes in household setting, Privacy is very important for sometimes women where they don't want some of the transaction to be transferred. They want to keep some of them guarded, right? If you kind of facilitate entire transparency for women, it might not be kind of welfare enhancing for them in some cases, right? Because you need to see this interaction with kind of social settings which exist, right? So that's just one case where you can see how it can go wrong. But just trying to focus on some of this positive is one of the major things that a uh, lot of people believe that uh, the uh, financial tools can help is women economic empowerment, right? As Halima was saying that, um, and so Kazim was saying that like for entrepreneurs, it's very important. Credit is one of the most important thing for entrepreneurs. And a lot of times social capital is an important predictor of who gets this credit, right? Uh, digital financial services are something that can help you to even that playing field, right? And that's one of the major things where you can lead the economic income route through entrepreneurship, through providing of much better credit access to women, as well as kind of building what we are calling credit history transaction, right? Just having that uh, like non-typical or non-orthodox um, history build up is very great for women. Just coming from business. And second set of impact or positive impact is at household level, right? We do think that uh, there are two aspects to it, right? Like, so bargaining power that women have within household, as well as how women preferences are kind of reflected in the household financial decision making. We do think that uh, digital services can kind of, if women can get access to fi uh, credit, that means they can actually have much more say in how some of the financial decisions are made in households. Or sometimes, given that the person who gets access to credit has much more preference reflected in household, getting women credit might mean that some of the outcomes that women care much more about men, for example, say girl child education or children's education, or maybe we don't want to kind of have less food for the last uh, month of the last week of the month, right? Some of these preferences, which are much more women driven than men driven, might be start reflecting much more in household, right? And that's kind of just impo kind of increases women economic empowerment, as well as these are some of the factors we think might be much better served for like financial inclusion in terms of getting women access, as well as their voices being heard and reflected in decision making. Thank you so much. I think that was extremely comprehensive. I want to turn to uh, Halima because uh, Boran, as far as I know, is uh, uh, Pakistan's first women-led uh, fintech startup, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, and 
I wanted to kind of pose the question to you coming more towards the solution side of things. Uh, what are some of the key pointers to keep in mind while designing financial solutions for women, especially from your specific experience? I think we would be very interested. Absolutely. Um, a lot of actually, a lot of points um, Smith um, touched upon in, in, in his answer right now, in his conversation right now. But I think it, it just boils down to how um, different genders would approach finance. For women, it is more of a lifestyle um, rather than just looking at finance or pure financial play. Um, and also, for women, a lot of financial activities is more communal and men do individualistic financial activities, at least from the personas that we cater to, which is your tier one, tier two cities, urban, um, uh, tier one, tier two urban cities and middle income uh, socioeconomic groups. And what we realized or figured out was that women want that agency authority um, and anonymity over finances. So a lot of the transparency that we talk about in the digital financial services, um, actually from a household perspective or her own agency perspective, she does not necessarily prefer that. So really going down deeper on what is her motivation what is what is her need and what are also the barriers for women in pakistan there is from a policy perspective there are still a lot of barriers in terms of kyc in terms of access to credit um and also then overall uh, <clears throat> penetration from just having a bank account as well right so really understanding what is her need um does she need a bank account or does she need access to capital first before she goes on to open up a bank account which becomes her primary bank account so why why does she need capital why does she need that digital financial services really really understanding that um and then being able to use the findings into what her day-to-day -day lifestyle would look like rather than coming up with a solution that would be completely alien to her lifestyle and would require a lot more um, hand-holding or digital or financial literacy. It is about automating or optimizing for her day-to-day -day financial behavior first before you come on to giving her a little bit more sophisticated financial product. So really understanding her digital financial literacy is also important because um, women, especially in markets like Pakistan and India, might not be um, <clears throat> financially literate, but also not digitally literate. The other thing is also predominantly in her household, financial decisions have been made by um, men when it comes to the outer world, but inside the house, she's the budget minister, right? She's making her day-to-day -day, uh, decisions from a from a uh, from a from a household perspective, and if you if you're able to understand that um, um, setting and um, context of why she makes those decisions and how she makes those decisions, and optimize that for her to start off with, it just becomes a lot easier to change that customer behavior by providing her with more sophisticated um, financial tools over time. What we also realized was, um, while we all talk about the importance of financial literacy uh, with the audience base that we worked with, um, giving just financial literacy without market access to financial products did not lead to a positive change in behavior. So, so coupling that, so more hands-on experience is what um, a woman, when you're designing for women, require. It's not just about throwing information at her. It is about how that information ties with that uh, market access of that product will change that behavior. The, the last thing that I would want to touch upon when, when you're talking about designing financial product is also how you want to distribute it. Women have... Uh, <clears throat> Um, it's not just about a financial product. The way they want the product to be distributed is very differently. She's she's always going to be moving in part communities. So her, for her, trust is extremely important. 
And um, while she operate, the reason she also does a lot of informal offline financial services within her community is because of that trust factor. So how do you translate that trust onto digital platforms for her to be able to be slightly more um, financially mobile is extremely important. And I think that that is a pure factor of how you distribute those financial products. So it's not about just building for her. It's also about distributing that her into her lifestyle where she doesn't have too much, too many barriers. Her life is already too busy. So anything that is um, extremely difficult for her to um, conceptualize or understand, she will run away. The easier we make it for her, the easier she understands and the better uptake of that product is. Thank you so much, Halima. And I think that's a very interesting perspective because it's not something uh, we commonly hear, especially any focus on lifestyle is almost like, oh, let's not have that conversation almost. But this is, I think, a, a, a very uh, fascinating insight on your part. Uh, I would like to come to uh, Kazim, and I feel like this question has been uh, kind of the elephant in the room in the entire conversation. All answers have uh, alluded to it in one way or the other. Uh, right from the very introduction of this uh, uh, panel. But uh, how can we ensure, based on all the uh, work that you have done in this field, last mile accessibility uh, for women uh, in the, you know, when it comes to financial, digital financial inclusion? So Satya, I think uh, there are sort of three, four aspects for this when it comes to last mile accessibility. Uh, for women, uh, I think first of all, when we design the products and we design the technology, uh, I think at the design stage, uh, we have to cater to making sure that you know it addresses the needs of the women and it it sort of is friendly, is easier to use. I think we see a lot of the times, even just the way uh, you know mobile phones are designed or the softwares, etc. I think there's a lot of uh, in, in sort of scope for improvement when it comes to how technology is developed from the scratch and greater integration of understanding how people at the grassroots interact with the technology, right? So uh, how can we make it easier for them to use it? How can we make it faster for them to use it? Are we taking feedback from the grassroots or from, from uh, different ecosystems, from different cities and towns and villages and women over there? And are they comfortable with using the phone the way it's designed and the software? Do they understand it as much as they should when it comes to being able to uh, come on the you know the digital uh, highway? So I think that's something which uh, needs to be done. A lot more feedback has to be taken by the engineers, by the developers to be able to design product and design technologies better. Uh, we often design the technology for the urban male. Uh, 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 ecosystem, we don't really go to the class. I think that has to change. I think second is the delivery of financial products and the delivery channels, uh, again, which, which uh, raise the awareness, which inform the women with respect to uh, what are the options available to her when it comes to accessing credit or when it comes to, uh, you know, using mobile payments or whatever else it could be or you know just driving commerce for example so those delivery channels uh, have to be a little more evolved and again they have to take a lot more feedback uh, from from the women themselves uh, then i think um, internet penetration at large what we are seeing in india it's fascinating i mean uh, we have a lot of mobile phone users internet users but uh, we still don't have a lot of informed internet users, right? And when I say informed internet users, I see uh, people from communities, societies, different working groups, different uh, women from different cultures, languages. Uh, I mean, there's, India is such a diverse country that uh, we don't have a strong level of uh, using the phone or the internet for carrying out maybe personal professional tasks. While they have access, they have it, but they usually are not as well versed to be able to use it uh, as their urban counterparts are. 
So I think that uh, needs to improve a lot more informed understanding of what are the benefits of technology, how it can help you scale up your business, how it can help you, uh, you know, meet your expenses, plan your budget, uh, make payments online, receive, uh, you know, the benefits of various schemes uh, online, right? So those aspects have to translate. So I think while internet usage is huge, informed usage, uh, and usage which is productive, which is helpful, is still there. Is still a sort of uh, a way to go. There's there's a long way to go over there. But at the same time, I think with the introduction of UPI, with the introduction of Aadhaar and all these uh, technology, the the government stack technologies, the GovTech ecosystem, which have penetrated into the into the last mile of Indian uh, towns and cities, that has really brought. Uh, people who were at the edge uh, of of some of these uh, so societal and social benefits which they were supposed to receive, it has actually uh, uh, you know widened the scope and the net of inclusion, and it has brought them into the sphere as well, and they have benefited from receiving uh, various uh, uh, taking advantage of various schemes which the government provides. So I think that connectivity has definitely taken us one or two levels up when it comes to accessing benefits, when it comes to accessing uh, you know, services from the government. Now the challenge is how do we scale it to another level and how do we maintain the rate of growth of informed internet users, of bringing more people into the financial net, of giving them more benefits and continuously doing that and doing that without a uh, violation to their privacy, doing that without harming uh, them in any way and uh, doing that without any breaches, minimizing the risk because uh, you know technology, while it's great when it comes to connectivity and it's great when it comes to uh, plugging the gaps of the last mile delivery of schemes for the benefit of the society. At the same time, there are a lot of challenges, right? So I think those challenges uh, sort of relate to breaches, privacy harms. Um, uh, you know, many times we've seen uh, that the beneficiaries, somebody else is receiving their their uh, due, their share of benefits which they were able to, they were supposed to receive in the scheme because of some issues within how the technology is implemented on the ground. So that infrastructure, the backend infrastructure of technology is still being developed. While UPI is a great example, uh, we are also seeing huge amount of payments going through through UPI. So you need to keep on investing in the technology to make sure that it, the failures are minimized, the risks are minimized, I think. And, and that's a work in progress, right? You, you will not get everything perfect. But I think what India has got right is the ability in the last few years to really cast the financial net very wide, bring a lot of people into it. And now the challenge is to sustain this and grow this further. Thank you so much, Kazim. And I think that was a comprehensive look at the policy side of things. Uh, Smith, do you think, what role do you think uh, research has to play in this ecosystem or rather how can it help and aid this uh, ecosystem? Is there a possibility that we can even effectively scale some of these uh, research outputs into tools. Yeah, so I think just just to briefly touch upon what Halima and Kazim were saying, right? Like trust is such an important thing, right? So one of the interesting thing that we observed during when we were doing our scoping work is so usually these women, the way their kind of financial lives uh, work worked out is essentially so they get their salaries on seventh of the month. In the first week of the month, after the salary is decreted, they go to ATM, withdraw all the money, then go to an agent who will remit however they do. But when they're remitting agent, what they will do is, whenever they say, they'll first call up everyone saying that, have you received money, go check everything, right? So trust factor is very important there. Similarly, for example, financial products are, I think, require way higher trust than other products. So for example, this women or study sample that we are talking about, almost 80 to 90% of them were using uh, WhatsApp and YouTube, right? So it's not they were not using this thing, but they were still very hesitant to use the financial transaction. So trust, building trust is very important, right? So I'll just talk about some of the things that we did uh, for the product. So 
when we realized that this didn't work, we kind of went back, tried to identify, do our trainings better. And we realized that the classroom training, every uh, we need much more hand-holding during this in, essentially training session for an art hall, right? So we need to not only just tell them if they have a problem, somebody should go solve them with them, right? So we kind of designed kind of two, three study arm randomized control trial where one study arm had typical classroom training that people do. And one was very like a batch setting of like four or five people and then somebody walking them through an hour long session, right? So uh, we had women dropping off at every level. So if we had 100 women in a study sample, finally at our end, we were able to get like 18 to 20 women who would be able to kind of actually have that app installed uh, in one hour training session to kind of do transition. And then uh, when we actually measured impact at the end line, so just to give you a broad numbers, when we had, so the control group, which was earlier using 5% of them were using the uh, digital transactions, the classroom training where we had like a, like 50%, 40 to 50 people classroom where instructor were telling, walking them through, which is typical setting in which how trainings are done. We were able to kind of double it. So 10 percentage point women were using it. I mean, the numbers are a lot, but like we were able to get five more percentage points. And then uh, when we looked at the like personalized intervention, we were able to get five more percentage points. So 5% in the control group, 10% in the classroom training group, and around 15% in like very individual training group. So it's like a glass, full glass, half empty situation for us, where we were like, we can say we like doubled or tripled the women who are using digital financial inclusion, but the overall amount of numbers still remains low, right? So that's kind of thing that we realized where the clear policy kind of guidance is, if you want to get this marginalized or women to get into access, you can't do it in like one classroom training session. You need sustained interaction with them uh, and have much more hand holding that was required, right? So that's one of the key learnings that we have where we do want to get, if you want this women to get access to, and this is just digital transaction that they definitely know they need and they're using. For getting into the advanced futures such as credit or insurance, higher financial services, it would need much more hand holding. So that's the, one of the key learning that we have, right? From research perspective, like what does it tell us, right? Like, and key aspect to kind of improve this research into real world is to try to kind of understand the mechanisms through which these are happening, right? And that's very key for kind of taking this, for example, this research could be just very contextual, where it's like, oh, for migrant workers working in garment sector in Bangalore, these are the constraints. But once you kind of understand underlying mechanisms that are preventing this women, then this research could be generalized, right? And that means research then can show much broader areas where how things could be addressed. So that's, the, I think, one of the major learnings that we can have from research is focusing on mechanisms rather than just outcomes, right? Where then you can just understand that this mechanism of trust or this mechanism of, say, um, hand-holding support that's required, which is much larger duration impact, then can go on to kind of every other financial service or product that you are kind of trying to trust, right? And then kind of going to scale up point of view is uh, like a question that every researcher grapples a lot because kind of uh, the first comes to design aspect, right? So a lot of time when I'm designing or working on design intervention, there's a very easy local context specific solution that I can divide. But the problem that gives is in long term, when I try to take it out, it becomes hard, right? So the very difficult trade-off that everyone faces is, do I spend much more time, effort, energy in making this solution generalizable? Or should I then try to kind of build something which is suited, right? And that's like issue of funding, time, effort, everything, right? But I think that's the, I think, crux where you do. And then also there's a question of scalability through buy-in where how much actually people want evidence-based policy or evidence-based policy solutions, right? Especially for research where we have spent so much time effort, is there a market demand for somebody actually trying to go for that, right? And that's a very difficult question to answer policy perspective. Uh, thank you so much, uh, like uh, Smith. And I think I want to get quickly into uh, keeping track of the time also. I want to get into the challenges 
uh, in facing, uh, I mean, designing inclusive solutions. And I would really like to leave uh, some time for audience questions as well, maybe 10 minutes at the end. Uh, Halima, I want to get back to you. Um, one, I think something that we've all been kind of uh, hinting at over here is, you know, the sort of grassroots level work that it takes to, you know, uh, actually solve uh, some of these uh, problems and design inclusive solutions. So the Oran committees, I think they are based on a pretty old principle of group savings. But um, what were some of the major challenges that you faced uh, setting up Oran and specifically the Oran committees across Pakistan? Absolutely. Um, it actually started with a personal experience where I couldn't open up a bank account as I moved back to Pakistan based on my gender, um, which led me to start researching that if people can't, women can't open up bank accounts, how are they saving? How are they, how are they uh, taking credit? What is going on on the market? Um, <clears throat> and what our research showed was that 41% of the Pakistani population engages in roskas, um, commonly called committees in Pakistan, where a group of people will come together and start saving or taking credit from each other um, for, for financial, for, for whatever purpose, like um, in their lives. And one of the things that we recognized in that was that uh, while this product works beautifully informally because of the trust factor there's a ton of inefficiencies in that but when you are bringing a platform that is or, or, or a product that is informally so widespread online the biggest challenge to solve for is trust um, and for us it was um how do you how do you cater to um, the, the the gaps in the market, which for us at that point was, hey, we women might not be financially savvy, giving them the right kind of information, um, putting groups and communities together and partnering with those communities to just help them have a better understanding of um, basic financial concepts so that they can be, they can make more informed choices. What we started at that point, re recognizing that financial literacy has to be coupled with market access. And that's where Uran committee started coming in. Um, because as we were going into different communities to, to build for those trust and, and understand how do you translate offline trust on online trust, um, we started recognizing that these women uh, wanted that access to capital, and that's where the agency authority and anonymity of their financial services started coming up very evidently. Um, so the challenges were largely around how do you build for trust, and that continues to be a problem, um, and that continues to also drive the kind of um, 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 Go to market strategies that we would have as as a for profit um, um, startup, um, because if you can't solve for trust and Smith mentioned it right like in financial services trust is it's difficult to 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 get and once broken it's very, very hard to get it back. Um, and that's not just your product related. It could be once you have a bad experience with anything that is even outside of your control. Um, if especially if a woman has a bad experience um, with the financial services, anything that's outside of your control, she will be not able to take that product on. Um, so, so it's about building those communities. It is about building that trust online. That is one of the largest challenges that continues to be something that we solve. Uh, thank you so much, Halima. And I was wondering, maybe we could also just expand a little bit. Uh, how can we better account for uh, like local social economic complexities when we design for uh, financial solutions? Would you have like a perspective on that? Yeah, absolutely. I think really understanding again the motivations of women, especially from a lifestyle perspective, and also. Um, they have a very different schedule, especially like your audience from 
anywhere from 23 to 38 year old where she would be which she would, would she would have younger children uh, her schedule is very different in life um so understanding that schedule um and understanding the language that she she speaks um to really build for the kind of financial services that she would require is important to understand um and and also being able to understand her motivation because as she goes through different life events her motivation changes as well she is she looks at finance from a very communal perspective rather than looking at from an individualist perspective so a lot of times it is hey i want to be able to uh, save up for my um um baby delivery or then um kids education or house renovation or travel with my family or just have a better um um emergency fund in case something happens to my partner or I will be able to contribute to my partners so really understanding her life events um according to her socioeconomic class and then giving her that access to capital uh, at the time that she needs it and making it easier for her to be able to understand the entire concept of it so language becomes extremely important her availability um when she is available to grasp that concept which is largely towards the end of the day or towards the early mornings of the day so being available when she's available is also really important to build um around her uh, thank you so much halima i would like to now open the floor for audience questions uh please do ask away and i will be sure to consider your question uh maybe i can start actually just get the ball rolling and then i can uh, pose some of these other questions that are also coming in uh i think my question would most likely be directed to kazim but uh, uh kazim you i i think when you were approaching uh, some of these issues yes we should uh, set up uh, this sort of uh, environment and ensure last mile access but coming back to the point that i wanted to pick up with you right at the beginning right like which is uh you know in the instance of certain uh like uh, how do we like set up the guardrails to ensure that there is not something too extractivist because you know going to the original point that i'd made in the introduction about the uh, where the un official basically said that there needs to be some carefulness about the way we go about mm -hmm. financial what are your, some of your suggestions or recommendations from the policy table as far as those guardrails are concerned yeah thanks satya so i think uh, you know we all love internet we love using it for payments we love using it for commerce uh, but as i think earlier mentioned that there, it's it's like a double edged sword while you get a lot of benefits you get a lot of advantages of using mm -hmm. it there are challenges associated i think the first and foremost is of course privacy of the user and i think in 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 india southeast asia at large in global south there is a lot more need for awareness around privacy right and what companies do when it comes to accessing data and you know a lot of the access and a lot of the technological connectivity which we are now seeing and the rise of applications we are able to make payments see credit online etc all of this comes at a cost and the cost is your privacy right so what you need is a very strong and powerful data protection law uh, in india we are fortunate that we've been seeing a very robust debate on this over the last 5 years and we hope next year we'll have a data protection law which puts in place some practices by companies right when it comes to uh, accessing data seeking consent of the user uh, you know data minimization limitation of purpose so some of these principles when it comes to collection of data and then using it for whatever service they are giving it to the users unfortunately uh, in many parts of the country in the tier 3 tier 4 cities at the grassroots level the awareness of privacy is not as much as it should be and also the people don't get people care but because there is not enough awareness they don't know much about it so they need to be informed that look what could be some of the issues when it comes to you know plainly giving out your data at all times do you really need to do this are you is 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 giving more let's say if you're giving seven 
points of personal data or personally identifiable information is that going to help you get service or will will it will it be enough if you give four points of personal information personal identifiable information so i think that kind of awareness has to be really uh, increased and delivered uh, and i think that's one of the so one of the most important guardrails we need to bring in uh, we, we saw this in the health uh, data management policy i mean it was great that the government rolled out the policy and talks about privacy and data protection uh, but we need an overarching law which protects it. so i think that's one second is i think you know uh, safeguarding people and users from fraudulent practices uh, and uh, what we recently saw in india was this uh, this phenomenon or this uh, you know this whole thing of chinese mobile applications giving loan to the users in india and uh, you know they were operating from china and they were sort of some of these apps suddenly mushroomed and they were they were giving cheap loan and cheap access to credit to a lot of people and then when they couldn't pay back uh, they had their agents call them up continuously and harass them and a lot of them a lot of the users actually committed suicide and this happened in india over the last year or two and the government took cognizance of that took cognizance of that and sort of really sort of uh, the police and the 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 the, the sort of the entire ecosystem and the police services they sort of looked into this issue um so how do we come up with practices where we can say okay this is an application this is a service which uh, uh, may or not commit any fraudulent practices how do we sort of come up to some of those uh, understanding i think that's something which people have to be made aware of uh, and i think the third point is around breaches just specifically around data breaches uh, data hacks i think there's a lot of uh, uh, awareness required and and some sort of safeguards where uh, you know companies uh, you know are more responsible when it comes to breaches and inform the users in india we saw uh, that there have been a rise in internet breaches and then of course the government has tried to take a lot of steps uh, but i think it's important that there is a better communication between the companies the, the app providers the developers and the user when it comes to data breaches and there should be more understanding of what are these breaches about and if there is if their data is at risk or not uh, so i think the, i think these are some of the sort of safeguards which we have to put in place um, and also just increasing the capacity of the police in india greater investments for the police to be able to you know uh, react and counter and investigate and arrest those people who are indulging in let's say fraudulent practices such as those chinese mobile loan application people right so i think a lot more capacity on the state side also has to be delivered uh, more funding required for the police and out, i think at the grassroots level where the police is operating and uh, you know the, a lot of these things are taking place breaches are taking place there needs to be a lot more investment and a lot more training provided to them so that they can deal with this problem with people living in you know at the grassroots in tier 3 tier 4 cities of the country while majority of the urban population has access uh, i think there is a greater need for implementation and capacity at the uh, grassroots we just have 3 minutes left there's a comment from pakoa lewis who says we want to see more community digital driven integration i think there are many examples of this oran is one of them which is highly like community based but also in latin america there are many successful examples of financial inclusions with a complete like a uh, community driven model now for this question we got from him in i would like to maybe have the panel maybe go like 30 seconds if possible try as best as you you can uh, across the panel starting maybe with uh, halima um, so this is i think we are fo focused more on disbursement of loan but concentration of digital collection is still in a primitive stage any views on this so halima please go ahead absolutely i think giving out money is very easy taking money back is the most hard part um and the way we solve for it again looking at the inherent um behavior of the customer and gamifying that experience a little bit women um uh, have never in especially in the context that we operate in have never been validated for a financial transaction so we make sure that when she is giving the loan back or depositing money into the savings group um we are rewarding that behavior 
um, um, so that she can get better access to capital in the future. Um, and I think that is, again, coupled with giving her the best practices, how can she improve her economic mobility, um, and really, really looking at more of a, from a holistic perspective rather than going blind and giving out um, credit where it could actually hurt the individual to take more credit given the financial situation they must be. So look at taking a very holistic approach, understanding their socioeconomic uh, uh, behaviors, understanding their meta behaviors in terms of how they use technology because these women might not have um, a high credit profiles if at all, right? Um, so taking that approach and giving more responsible credit um, to be able to take that credit back and reward that uh, collection um, from having better access to capital. We're in our last 30 seconds, so I'm very sorry there will not be closing remarks, but I hope this has been a substantive action pack session. <laughs> and I hope you've uh, uh, been, you know, I, I hope you found this illuminating. Uh, thank you all so much for coming. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Satya. Thank you. Thanks, Satya.